Well, welcome back. Um, I started grading your exams over the weekend and did grade the people who took version A, and they're doing pretty well. So we'll see how the version B people do. I plan to have those graded by tomorrow sometime. Got some things on Moodle that I want to point out to you. Um, so I've got the assignment due on Wednesday the 29th up here now. It includes an extra reading assignment that I'm titling, oh, it has got a long title, Flows for Nonlinear Autonomous Systems and New Ways to Classify Equilibrium Points. One, as hyperbolic or not hyperbolic. Two, as stable, asymptotically stable or unstable. So that will be an extra reading assignment. I'm not quite finished in writing it right at the moment, here in 2015, the 27th of April. But I'm planning to uh, go ahead and post a partial um, notebook anyway and hopefully finish it tomorrow or the next day and post an updated note. Uh, another note, if you skipped in working on the comp homework number 29, these three problems, and I, I wouldn't blame you if you skipped them because I really shouldn't have assigned them so soon, um, I would strongly encourage you to work on them. Uh, in the next day or two, there are problems related to bifurcations with nonlinear systems, which I haven't talked about in class at all, so I should not have assigned them. Um, I'm not going to make them something you need to turn in, but I will talk about an example today, hopefully, and it's something that you should know. We'll probably do another example or two still this week. It's something you should work on, uh, but you won't have to turn it in at all. There is a regular completion assignment though due on Wednesday, and it's three problems, but they're real long problems, so that's why it's only three. I've separated them out like this. They combine things to do from both section 5.1 and 5.2. So the first problem you see here is in green. This thing here, can you see that? It's not really easy to see in green. 13A, B, and number 11. 13 is from 5.1, and 11 is from 5.2, they're the same system, okay, but you're doing different things with them, so you're combining these into one problem. Likewise, 14 from section 5.1 and number 12 from section 5.2. I also added a comment that you should consider the whole plane, so don't think of this as necessarily an interacting species model, is what I'm trying to say. Consider negative values for x and y as well. And the third one is a long problem, that's really the combination of three problems. In this case, all from section 5.2. See how the color scheme works here? Green for the first one, magenta for the second one, and green again for the third one. Use technology whenever you want, though you should try to draw phase planes by hand and try to make your technology use minimal as far as drawing the phase plane. We want to get practice at drawing phase planes by hand without using technology and without seeing the, the vector plot in the background. It'll be less accurate that way, but it is a good skill to try to gain skill at drawing these things by hand without technology as much as possible. There will be a, a graded assignment as well. One problem there, 5.1 it's a, it's a multi-step problem, so it's fairly involved, as all these problems are. Got supplementary videos as usual, um, but this is what's due by sometime on Wednesday, 2 p.m. for the homeworks as usual. All right, so let's move on to talking about doing a, an example or two here. We considered a competing species system before the test last week. Let's consider another competing species system. This time we're making it more complicated. Why is that more complicated? Well. Got a couple squared terms here that aren't usually there. There's a y squared there and there's an x squared there. It's still competing species. X and y are both not negative. So these interaction terms are both going to contribute to dx dt and dy dt in a negative way. It's just that we're having a square there to make it more complicated, more interesting, see what happens. Whether this is realistic or not is you know, a different question. We're just considering the math of this, what happens with the pure math. Of course, these Interacting species models shouldn't be taken too seriously anyway as far as their predictive value. They mostly tell you things that could happen rather than things that will happen. They're sort of general moral of the story and different type of things. There's a y squared in there as well. So it's some sort of logistic model for y except with the squared term there instead of the regular first power term. 
All right. So try to get as far as we can without technology. I will use technology, especially to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors when I linearize. I'm going to go ahead and multiply those out. Well, let's, let's write it in factor form first to help us find the null clines and the equilibrium points. So I will, in the first equation, factor out the x. Like that. Maybe you want to pan back to the screen so we can compare again. So there's an x term, there's an x, x factor in both this term and that term. It can be factored out. Likewise, in the dy dt equation, there's a y factor in this term and this term. It can be factored out as well. Leaving us with that. Let's draw the null clines first before we linearize. So the x null cline. is going to come from where the x dt is 0, that's x equals 0, which is the y-axis. And when this is 0, 480 minus 8x minus 6y equals 0. You don't have to solve that for y. By the way, you, you can. You can put the 6y on the other side and divide everything by 6. y would equal 80 minus 4 thirds x, and it's, it's going to be aligned with a y-intercept of 80 and a slope of negative 4 thirds. But you also can just look at this equation and see, by thinking about it, what the x and y-intercepts will be. You'll find the y-intercept when you set x equal to 0 and solve for y. That's 0. You get 480 minus 6y is 0, so y would be 480 divided by 6 would be 80. And you can find the x-intercept by setting uh, y equal to 0 to make that term go away. 480 minus 8, x equals 0 means x equals uh, 480 divided by 8, and that would be 60. So you don't have to solve for y is what I'm trying to say. This is, this is not my final picture. This is just an initial picture. The y-axis is one x null cline, and the line that looks about like this, where that's 80. <coughs> And that 60 is also part of the x null plane. If you start on the y-axis, you're going to stay on the y-axis. You're going to go straight up or straight down. If you cross this one, you're going to cross horizontally. Oops, sorry, vertically. It's an x null plane. Whether you go up or down, you have to think about one. With the y null plane, That's where dy dt equals 0, y equals 0, that's the x-axis, or where this is 0, setting that equal to 0 is equivalent to saying x squared plus y squared is 50 squared. Setting that equal to 0 gives you a circle centered at the origin of radius 50. Start on the x-axis, you're going to stay on the x-axis, you're going to cross this quarter circle. That's a y no cline, so you're going to cross horizontally. All right, I'm going to make a big picture over here to try to put these things together. And let's even see if we can see how much of the phase plane we can guess how well we can draw it, even without linearization. The question will be is how, how good is my drawing going to be? That's the real issue. Um, let's put 50 right here. So 100 or so would be right about there. 80. Does that look about right? No, probably not. Looks like it's not far enough to the right. That look better for 50? Hard to tell when you're close to the board. Okay, what was the other intercept? 60 was another intercept. So we've got the line goes from 80 down to 60. 
no boy. And the circle looks like this. I'm not sure how good this drawing is, probably not real good, but there are going to be a couple intersection points I know I looked ahead. Okay. There are going to be a couple intersection points here and here that are going to correspond to equilibrium. I'm going to cross this one vertically, that's an X null line. Cross this one horizontally. What about the signs of dx, dt, and dy, dt in these different regions? We've got, in the first quadrant, we've got one, two, three, four, five different regions that solutions probably are going to go in different directions in. Think about it this way. You don't have to plug in points, but you can just think about it. If you're down here, close to the origin, relatively speaking, x and y are both small, what are the signs of dx, dt, and dy, dt? These two things are always positive, so you don't have to worry about those. If x and y are small, close to zero, that's positive, that's positive. Solutions are going to move to the northeast. Maybe prefer emphasizing first that dx dt is positive, second that dy dt is positive, and the combination of those means solutions are going to move to the northeast. On the other hand, when x and y are both far from zero, both of these are going to be negative. And solutions are going to move to the southwest. To the left and down, they're going to move to the southwest. Okay, these are just little drawings to help me realize what directions to move in. By the way, we do have other equilibrium points. The origin certainly is. This one is right there as well as this one, but not these two points. It's where x and y null clients cross that you get equilibrium, not where an x null client crosses another x null client. So altogether, if you include the axes, we've got looks like five equilibrium points. What about signs up here? You could pick a point if you want, like maybe the point to be safe, uh, 1, 51. x is 1, y is 51. It's going to affect the sign of this thing, not the sign of that thing. Which should make sense. We go on the other side of the circle, not the other side of the line. This thing is going to become negative. That thing is going to stay positive. You can plug in specific numbers for x and y if you like. The x dt stays positive, the y dt becomes negative. Solutions have to move to the southeast. In here, it's a similar thing. We're outside the circle, but still underneath the line. Solutions are still going to move to the southeast. In here, it's the other way around. We're inside the circle, but over on the other side of the line, dy dt is negative, excuse me, dx dt is negative, dy dt is positive. You see that just barely in there? Solutions have to move to the northwest. So let's see, how much can we draw without linearization? What if you started with an equilibrium with a with a uh, initial condition right about there, close to the y-axis? It's probably going to stay close to the y-axis for a little bit. Head up this way. You cross this null client. You've got to cross it horizontally before heading back down, evidently toward this equilibrium point. If I pick another initial condition up here, similar kind of behavior. I pick an initial condition in here. It's got to go to the southeast goes toward that point as well. Pick one up here, it's going to the southwest first, then it's got to cross this null client vertically before heading to the southeast. What if I'm over here as my initial condition? I've got to go to the northeast, evidently have to cross this null client this way, then head to the northwest and head toward that point. That seems to be a sink. And it doesn't seem to be spiraling.
Is there some sort of separatrix that heads tr straight toward that point? Well, I wouldn't use the word straight. It's not necessarily a straight line, for one thing. I wouldn't call it a separatrix because the long-term behavior on either side is the same. However, I think there is a solution that heads toward that point in such a way that it's not going to cross one of those no lines. That should make intuitive sense. Should you count this thing as a separatrix? Well, not really. There probably is a separatrix in a sense that heads from this point toward this point as time goes by. And actually, this is very subtle. It's actually, I made it go like, like it's going up at first. It's never going to go up because you've got to go to the southeast in this. It's going to hug close to the circle before moving a little bit away from it before coming to that point. It's kind of a subtle thing. Don't worry about it too much. What if I'm down here? I head to the northeast, I get across this thing, and then head to the southeast. And evidently, if I'm over here, perhaps, the same kind of thing happens. Is there a separatrix to this point? Yes. There's going to be some solution that starts near this point and heads toward that one as time goes to infinity. And again, even though I'm drawing this, the curve to kind of, kind of connect these equilibrium points, it doesn't literally touch them. It just approaches this one as t goes to minus infinity and approaches that one as t goes to plus infinity. That seems to be a separatrix separating solutions that head toward that point as t goes to plus infinity from solutions that head toward this point as t goes to plus infinity. Likewise, there's going to be one out here. Other solutions are going to look like this. There's a separatrix going from this one to this one. Difficult to draw in there. There's another one going from this one down to this one. Seems like we're getting a pretty good idea of behavior of the system without actually linearizing. That's, that's worthwhile to try to get good at, but it takes some practice. And I'm not claiming I'm perfect at it. I can make plenty of mistakes and draw things imperfectly. Definitely I could draw it better if I had the direction field in the background. But this is the kind of thing you want to work at doing, as well as linearizing. Looks like the origin is probably a source. This point's probably a saddle. There's a sink, there's a saddle. There's probably a sink, but nothing seems to be spiraling, at least as far as we can tell. Now let's linearize to check all that. And I think for the sake of time, we'll also find the equilibrium points of Mathematica. You should be able to find these kind of equilibrium points by hand, though. I should mention how to do it. I mean, certainly the origin is 1. Certainly uh, x equals 60 was 1 y is 0. Certainly y equals 50 was 1. When x is 0, y can be 50 to make that 0. But if you set this equal to 0 and that equal to 0, you should be able to find the other two equilibria. And the method would be, when that's equal to 0, solve for y as a function of x. Then plug that function into there for y. You'll get a quadratic in x that you can use the quadratic formula for. You might get irrational roots, but they probably are not complex here. They shouldn't be. And then once you've got that value for x, you can substitute it back into this equation to solve for y. So it can be done. Let's use Mathematica to find them, though, precisely. So I'll type my function in here, my right-hand side functions. I'll go ahead and type them as I got them on the screen here. There's a little f. Little g. And let's go ahead and set those equal to 0 and solve for x and y.
Yep, I did check it ahead of time. The two points in the first quadrant, not on the axes. Uh, this one, 30, 40, and this one. Uh, let's see, 234 divided by 5, what's that going to be? 46.8, I think. Something that right to you. 46.8. And this one's going to be what? 17.6. Uh, you can use and solve instead. Get those approximations, or do slash slash n at the end. There they are. What about the Jacobian? Well, let's uh, actually I'm going to try something interesting. I, I think this will work. I can certainly find the derivatives of f and g with a capital D like that. But I also right away could put these in a matrix. Save some time of copy and paste, but then make appropriate changes here. Change this to a y. Change this to a g. Change this to a g and this to a y. There's the Jacobian matrix as a list. I could make it look like a matrix by doing slash slash matrix form. But I think I can also do the following. This is kind of an interesting thing to do. Let me call, let me give this a function name. I'm going to call it J. I'm going to think of J, the Jacobian matrix, as a function of x0 and y0, where x0 and y0 represent the coordinates of the equilibrium points. However, as it stands, this is not going to work because there's no x0, y0 on the other side of the definition here. However, I believe if I do a slash dot, which stands for replace all, and then in the curly braces here, put x arrow, x0, comma, y arrow, y0, that will take the derivatives first and then effectively plug in x0 and y0 at the end. You can see the general Jacobian like this. And we can plug in specific numbers, like our equilibrium points here. And that's what you want to plug in, is you want to plug in the equilibrium points. So for example, j at 30, 40. Is that. The trace is negative. negative 3,440. Is the determinant positive or negative? Well, that's going to be, this point uh, is, looks like it's going to be a sink. So I bet the determinant's positive. So we, otherwise, it would be a saddle. Can I do that in my head? Probably not. Not. ET, J, 40. positive. Its trace is negative, but the real key is if you're trying to decide about spiraling behavior or not. I keep forgetting that extra survey. I mean, the trace is negative, the determinant is positive, so in the trace determinant plane you're over in the third quadrant, the second quadrant. So it's definitely a sink. It doesn't seem to be spiraling. So I'm guessing it's not a spiral sink. How would you prove that? You'd want to be below that repeated root parabola. You'd want to check, without calculating the eigenvalues, that the what would it be? The determinant is smaller than the square of the trace divided by four. There's the repeated root parabola. D equals t squared over four. I'm guessing we're underneath it. So I'm guessing our trace and determinant would satisfy the property that d, that t squared over 4 is going to be smaller than d.
D is going to be smaller than T squared before I get confused too. We're going to be below that D. The D coordinate at this point is relatively small. Smaller than T squared over 4. That should be what, what happens here. So if I take the trace and square it and divide by 4, I should get a number bigger than 336,000. Yes. Okay, that confirms that we are in the case of a real sink, a non-spiral sink. And so that means we have a real non-spiral sink for this non-linear system at that point. I can certainly check the other points. I'm not going to take the time to because what I would rather do is show you, I think to save time we'll still use Mathematica, show you that you can think of this in terms of translating the axes to a new variable, new axes, new variables. Remember, when you linearize at the origin, you don't have to use the Jacobian matrix. You can just throw away the nonlinear terms. We should probably check that. Um, this thing, if you expand it out, is 480x minus 8x squared minus 6xy. The nonlinear terms are those two. Throw them away for linearization. Only consider the 480x. For this one, you've got 2500y minus y cubed minus x squared y. Throw those nonlinear terms away. For the linearization near the origin, just consider the 2500y. In other words, the linearization should be a Jacobian matrix with 480 in the upper left corner, 0, 0, and then 2500 in the lower right corner. You see that just by looking at the formula? Yep. Plug in x0 equals 0, y0 equals 0, you get 480. 0, 0, 2,500. What about linearizing near some other point? Like this point we just thought about here, this point 30, 40. Can that be done without the Jacobian matrix is what I'm trying to ask. Yes, it can. It can be done by throwing away nonlinear terms once you've translated the axes appropriately. Translate the axes so that the origin is now at that point. So it's a new coordinate system. Give this axis a new name, u and v. This point has x, y coordinates 30, 40, but u, v coordinates 0, 0. But how do you Throw away the nonlinear terms. You have to do the substitution. Since I'm translating uh, x to the right by 30, u should be x minus 30. And since I'm translating y upward by 40, v should be y minus 40. You want to get your original right hand sides in terms of these new variables u and v. It's a substitution, just like you do in Calc 2 for integrals or Calc 1 even. You're going to have to replace each x with u plus 30 and replace each y with v plus 40. That's something you should be able to do by hand. I mean, in these expressions. But it would take 5 to 10 minutes, probably. And you might be prone to make a mistake. In fact, I was trying it before class, and I was making a mistake I couldn't find for a few minutes. Let's just have Mathematica do it. So replace x with u plus 30, replace y with v plus 40. Do it for both f and g. There they are. I don't know why they took so long. Oh, uh, well, unsimplified. I think expand will be the best thing to do. Okay, what happens? Well, first do note that u comma v equals zero comma zero is an equilibrium point in terms of the new variables. Because you don't have any constant terms. That's good. Right? 
plug in equals zero, V equals zero, you get zero. What happens if you throw away the nonlinear terms? In this one, you get rid of the negative 8u squared and the negative 6uv. You're left with negative 240u minus 180v. Hmm. Negative 240, negative 180. Negative 240, negative 180. What about the other one? Get rid of the nonlinear terms there. We're going to get rid of the, that one there, this one there, this one, this one, this one. You're only left with negative 2400 U minus uh, 3200 V. Negative 2400, negative 3200, yes. Okay? So that's effectively what we're doing. And because of that, that's why on the test, I emphasize thinking about the linearized system in terms of a new variable that I called capital U, whose components really are little u and little v. The linearization, for example, at 3040 is whatever I got. Negative 240, negative 180, negative 2400, and negative 3200. The eigenvectors are helpful as well in these cases. In fact, let's just go ahead and do eigen system. Eigen system. This matrix. Get the eigenvalues, which should both be negative real numbers and the corresponding eigenvectors. Complicated, irrational quantities, but they are real. And they are both negative. That's one's negative because of the negative sign there. This one's negative because 43 is bigger than the square root of 1639. Two negative real eigenvalues. Are these eigenvectors helpful? They actually are. They are going to approximate the directions of possibly separatrices. When you zoom in near this point, for the corresponding linearized system, the eigenvectors are going to correspond to straight line solutions. They don't correspond to straight line solutions in the nonlinear system because typically there are no straight line solutions. They might look straight. What directions will they have? The one negative 100 that's closer to zero, if you try to sketch the direction of that eigenvector, um, approximately like this, that's corresponding to the eigenvalue closer to zero. And I'm not drawing it perfectly, but that's what most solutions are going to be tangent to as t goes to infinity. And that should make sense based on the way the drawing looks because that's the eigenvalue that's closer to zero. The other eigenvalue that's much further from zero corresponds to an eigenvector that is almost vertical, about like that. So probably when a solution approaches this point, it's the, the one solution that doesn't cross the null lines that I drew initially like this probably comes in more like this. Let's see if we can get the stream plot to show that. Let me erase this one there. It's probably going to come in close to vertical. Let's see what the stream plot shows. Yeah, I mean, I'm not showing the equilibrium points. The 
one at 3040, it's right about there. And this curve right there seems like it's the one that goes straight towards it without crossing one of the milk lines, or at least it's close to that. These other ones look a little funny here with stream plot. They're going practically vertical as well, but they do cross that milk line horizontally. So they, they have to turn pretty sharply. You can't really see that with the stream plot, but that's what's going to happen. They're going to make a real sharp turn. Let's go ahead and put the milk lines in. Plot. f of x, y equals equals zero and g of x, y equals equals zero. For all you can tell, it, it looks like it's not crossing that milk line horizontally, but it is. It looks are deceiving. It goes up to that and just makes a real sharp turn when it gets to the milk line. It actually does cross it horizontally before it heads down to this point. Um, likewise, well, these do look like they're crossing vertically here. Crossing horizontally there. Anything else that's kind of subtle about this? Here you are crossing this orangish one, again, horizontally there. It's got to make a real sharp turn. So without the technology, you, you really aren't going to know very well that the behavior is going to be like that, that you're going to go straight upwards almost and only make a very sharp turn across the milk line when you get really close to it. That's not something you would necessarily know without the technology. And I wouldn't be expecting it without the technology. The kind of pictures I drew here are not really accurate. I should be drawing it more like this. But in the absence of technology, we're not worried about that. It's the same overall qualitative behavior anyway in terms of long-term behavior. What are you approaching as t goes to infinity? Very subtle kinds of things can go on. All right, what time do we have here? In about seven minutes or so. Um, this is a family of systems. There's a parameter. Our old friend A. So we're doing more than just looking at phase planes here. We're also looking for bifurcation. Let's just spend our, our remaining time seeing if we can set up a bifurcation of this visually in Mathematica. All right, save some time here. Copy paste. Well, okay. Let's grab this one here. Uh, G depends on A, so I probably better put some subscript on the G like this. Seven D minus X here, minus X Y there. This is A minus Y and minus two X Y. So G, the right hand side of the dy dt equation, depends on A, the parameter as well. And I try to solve it with solve. I need an A there. I, I don't think N solved. Well, let's see what N solved produces anyway. I guess it does produce output. Question? Yeah. Um, so putting the A in subscript versus mm -hmm. that, is that any difference? Is it just it, you can do it without the subscript, but I prefer doing it with the subscript to emphasize that you have a bunch of different functions here, G sub A, for many different values of A. That's my preference to do it that way. Okay. So it's like the notation kind of. Yep. Mm -hmm. I try to put parameters in the subscripts. I, I think I may have mentioned that once before, but it's certainly something that might have been confusing. Three, uh, two of the fixed points are the same no matter what A is, 70, 0, and 0, 0. Two of them depend on A. 0, A, and negative 70 plus A, and 140 minus A. 
So you have a dependence on A there. Copy and paste the picture, put it inside a manipulate. Change the G to a G sub A. Is the animation parameter, so it's outside the show, inside the manipulate still. Uh, it really only makes sense for A to be positive, but let's see what happens when A starts out negative anyway. Uh, how big should A be? Well, it looks like maybe you want to go up to at least 140, based on those formulas there. Let's go up to 150. And we'll probably need performance goal in here. Quality. I can put the equilibrium points in there with list plot, have not. So far we only see two equilibrium points that are at least on the axis or in the first quadrant, the origin and this one. There's a point down there where y is negative that's also technically an equilibrium point if you're not thinking about the application. What happens as A increases? The null clines move and the stream plot changes as well. That doesn't seem like it was. Oh, that's, I only put the focus goal in one spot, that's why. Now I think they stay arrows. Runs a little slower. So we're seeing how A affects what happens. You want to think qualitatively here. What are the big qualitative changes? When A is small, when A is negative, which again is not realistic, it seems like the main qualitative feature is that that is a sink for most, if not all, solutions in the first quadrant, except on the axes. Again, A being negative is not a realistic population model, but the main feature to note here is that points a sink. Looks like it might almost be a spiral sink, but I don't think so, because yeah, it can't be, because the x-axis um, solutions that start on the x-axis have to stay on the x-axis, so you can't wind around. When A gets up to zero, that's the edge of it being an accurate model. Well, I shouldn't say accurate, but a plausible model. Main feature is still that that point is a sink. A increases past zero, it's still a sink, still a sink, but you have a new equilibrium point here. Right there. That looks like it's probably a saddle. Sink in this direction, saddle in the other direction, or source in the other direction. But still, in the long term, solutions are approaching that one. Does that ever change when A gets big enough, like 70, I think? The equilibrium point, we get a new equilibrium point that's still in the first quadrant or on the axes. Watch up in the upper left there. There was an equilibrium point to the left of the y-axis, but that's not realistic because that would be x being negative. Right there, those equilibrium points merge at the point 0, 70. As A increases, then they split again, both now in the first quadrant or on the axes. And it seems like this one is probably a saddle point, sort of coming towards it in this direction and probably away in that direction. And this point probably is a sink, hard to tell doesn't look like a sink. But I bet it's a sink. I bet solutions, looks like a solution that would start here and go and cross this one horizontally with a sharp turn before heading back up towards it. So we get a new kind of behavior once A gets past 70. New kind of long-term behavior. If X is small enough, essentially, then X dies off and Y heads toward whatever the Y coordinate of that point is. Besides that still being a sink. And probably as A increases more, it 
just expands for that upper left point as far as how many points move toward it as t increases. That's what we're seeing here. And when a is large enough, like 140, now, now it's the lower right one that is not doing so well. Uh, y is much more likely, or less likely to die off. Y is likely to thrive for most initial conditions. Does that make sense with the equations? Uh, when A, just 30 seconds here, when A is small, mostly it was X that was benefiting and Y was dying off. When A is large, then Y was benefiting more in the initial conditions. And X was more likely to die off. The carrying capacity of Y is what A represents, so that should make some intuitive sense. Alright, see you on Wednesday.